This year was the 40th anniversary of Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back. As such, just like we got for the 40th anniversary for Star Wars A New Hope, well, we're getting 40 stories from a certain point of view. So yes, this is Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back from a certain point of view. So, as, a, as obvious as 40 stories, each from the point of view of a different character. Um, such as the Tauntaun that Luke rides. And we get that whole point of view. Um, we get the Wampus point of view. Yes. Um, we get we get lots of point of views in this. Um, we even get uh, the point of view of the Dark Side Cave. Which I would say is probably the most interesting story so far. Because like. It, what really makes it interesting is how it relates to Yoda. Is what I'm, I'm not going to spoil it. But it is probably. It's. It might be, as I'm saying this, I'm just deciding right now, might be one of my favorite stories out of the the 4D. Um, it's just the most unique. And yeah, we've gotten points of views of animals and droids before, but never a cave, never a tree, and never a environmental landmark place. It's just a very unique story, and I would really encourage you, if you read none of the other stories, to read that one. But there's plenty of other unique stories too. Um, we get the point of view of one of the Imperial Ensigns who, I think her rank was an Ensign, um, but one of the Imperial officers who is in charge of monitoring all the probe droids they sent out, yes. And then at the end of the story she's like, because she uses the probe droid to look at the battle and the aftermath and that just changes her entire point of view, literally. And yeah, I'm spoiling that one, um, because that's not the only case where we have, uh, have where the the um, imperial point of view, the um, the the way I'm looking for is their um, allegiance or their or the perception of their allegiance changes. Um, later on, we get the story of an imperial stormtrooper who is literally defecting as the empire is taking over Cloud City. So we get a few of those stories where an Imperial character realizes that you no, know, the Empire is not as good as we saw or as they saw it, so they get out or start undermining it from the inside. So we get a few of those, but we also get you no, know, you no know, pro Imperial. You no, know, we get the story of a waste reclamation officer who is technically no longer an officer, so but he's still in charge of waste reclamation. So does that make him a a warrant officer, as as would be the best equivalent I can think of the U.S. Navy. It's a complicated thing, um, but basically he gets, you know, launched out in the garbage by Boba Fett. Seriously, I'm not making that up. But yeah, I'm throwing that. But he's still, you know, pretty pro-imperial, because, you know, the, still pretty much he's just angry at this. But he's willing to, you know, look a few things on the side for his own benefit, kind of, imperial. Um. But we also get general views, um, Admiral Piet, I think, even Admiral Arzo. I might be wrong with Admiral Arzo. Um, but we get other Imperial point of views as well. Ray Sloan, she's popping up in many Star Wars books here and there. We get her point of view because, I don't know, she's returning from a mission and finds that her Star Destroyer has been destroyed while she was gone. Yeah. And then we also get a point of view of the temporary captain for her Star Destroyer. Which I think is just neat. And we, we get all these different points of views. General views we is probably the most interesting one. Um, I'm not going to spoil it too much. But I would say. he just I'll just let you know this. He, in Empire Strikes Back. When when Vader turns around in one scene. He's looking right in the face of an Imperial officer. There's probably less than 6 inches between them. And that's general views. And Vader says general. Um, prepare your troops for ground assault. Or something along those lines. He was the officer who stood within six feet, on correction, I mean six inches of Vader and did not flinch. And they use that for a lot for his characterization in here. He, and also in Empire Strikes Back, we see Ad, uh, Admiral Piet's reaction to a hum, is the back of a homeless Vader. We also get Veer's reaction to it, and it's actually very different. Um, actually, I would encourage you to read both those stories, because... They both have very different insights into Vado, um, that are thus insights into their own characters. 
we also get point, other points of view. We get plenty of points of view of the rebels. One such point of view, we get, you know, a person who's in charge of the Ion Canyons. Then we get a person who works in, in the Echo Base Galley, who's basically a, a, who everyone sees as a klutz, who messes things up all the time, isn't fit to do anything. Um, we also get a bunch of other um, po rebel point of views as well. Um, Hank Green writes a point of view story for a naturalist, so basically someone who's studying the natural environment. Um, what end up that person's point of view on top, and that person, I'm not going to tell you what happens to them, but it's definitely the most different of the rebel point of views we get. And we get the point of view of a simple rebel soldier uh, uh, in the trenches. We even get Wedge's point of view in the aftermath of the battle, how far he needs to reform his squadron. Now, Commander Skywalker, so Luke is missing. We know he's on Dagobah, but does the rebel lines know that? No. Um, and so he has to reform Rogue Squadron, but he renames the Red Squadron because, because of the emotional attachment to all the people they lost in the Battle of Hoth, which is a nice way of explaining why they go back to Red Squadron in in Return of the Jedi. And and that's just a neat story. It did very much remind me, you probably can't see them down here, but the I got some of them down there. Probably, I think I got one or two over there. Um, but the X-Wing books, especially because there's a because there's a devoted two to three chapters in those books to Wedge having to reform and rebuild Rogue Squadron after a bunch of fighting the Empire, and that's kind of the starting point for those novels. And from that, the story f from Wedge's point of view in this, they give me that like the person who wrote that I think might have read the beginning of um of st the Star Wars X-Men Rogue Squadron book and also maybe the Wraith Squadron book as well because they both feature Wedge forming a squadron. I would I have I just got touches of that different also of course, but I feel like the author of it, whose name I just forget one of these people. Um, I feel like they took some inspiration from those. I could be totally wrong, but I hope I'm right. Um, and we get other point of views as well. Plenty of point of views on Cloud City. Now we get the point of view of the chef who who had to prepare the meal that we still don't know if they ate or not. Um, which is, and it's like just the chef and her sous chef who's an ugnaught. And they'll have to prepare a meal for Vader. Yeah. And then of course the ugnaught gets the idea and they should try to poison Vader. And like, yeah, that probably would be good if Vader ate. We don't even, Vader probably just gets his nutrients through an IV or something. Seriously. Um, and so I seriously want to know, did, no, did the people actually eat? I'm just now imagining Vader and Boba just sitting there at the table, looking at everyone else, expecting them to eat, but everyone being too nervous to eat. I would love, actually, if that was somebody's point of view story as well. Um, but we get other point of view stories as well. Um, you know, we get the point of view of um, the daughter of a wealthy Cloud City um, um, businessman. Um, we get the point of view of, of an Agna worker who's like, you know, trying to convince her clan to leave. Um, we get the point of view of a crazy homeless person who thinks he's the king of Cloud City and that, that Lando is his regent. And I, I'm, not, I'm going to kind of spoil that one and say that Lando actually likes the guy, so tolerates him, which I think is just so... Which is, I think, just something Lando would do, you know, makes him look... You know, just makes him look good that he's tolerating this one crazy person kind of deal. And there's just plenty of other stories as well. We get one where um looks like a bartender is having a relationship with an Imperial officer. And then they conspire to make a... And we get both the point of views. And they conspire to make that Imperial officer superior look like a fool. Um, It's a weird story. I had trouble following it. And I still think I might need to reread it. Because it's just a... Um, this, 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 what makes it difficult is it's the only story where we get two characters' points of views, and sometimes it's hard to um, go between them. But there's another story where we get three characters' point of views. That's right, we get the Millennium Falcon, or specifically L3, and the two other droid brains in the, in the Millennium Falcon. I won't talk too much about it, um, but she, so L3 and Lando do kind of share a scene in it. Um, and we also find out that um, L3 likes R2-D2 more than she likes C-3PO. Yeah, that stands to reason. And then we also learn that learn the um, 
Chargeball Joy that we see helping Han at the beginning of Empire Strikes Back and repairing the Falcon, or near the beginning, I should say, um, is, no, is Han Solo's droid on the name Falcon who helps with repair work. And, and yeah, that's actually kind of good to know, but in in the effort to that Cloud City's computer to know that the Imperial sabotage the Millennium Falcon's um hyperdrive tried to get destroyed, which is kinda sad. Um and it was like and it's it was a it's a very neat story about droids basically and I would highly encourage you to read it. And there's plenty more stories as well. Um but to remember them all is very um Difficult. We also do get Palpatine's point of view in all of this, you know, um, because I only remember because I happened just to turn to, to the page where they're, they're talking about it. Um, but it's definitely a very interesting story. Oh, we also get the Exegol's point of view, another very interesting story. I encourage you to read. And also we get um, Obi-Wan Kenobi's point of view as a ghost and like, and him rationalizing things and like, you know, it's talking about what and all that, trying to discourage Luke from confronting Vader and all that. There's so many interesting stories that I really don't want to talk too much more. Otherwise, I'll spoil them all for you. So, I think I'm going to leave kind of what I said at that. Normally, I do talk more spoilers, but in this case, a lot of these stories need to be experienced firsthand and are very, very good. So feel free to let me know in the comment section down below what you thought of this book, what you would like to add to this discussion on these 40 stories. I would love to hear from you. And I do try to get back to every comment that I get on my channel. Sometimes it does take longer, but I do try to get back. Also, feel free to check me out on social media, Facebook and Twitter. Links are below, along with links for my Discord server and my website. So go consider checking that stuff out if you are so interested. So thank you for watching my video. If you haven't liked or uploaded the video yet, please consider doing so. Also, consider following or subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet done so. And feel free to follow either the video or the playlist on screen now. And as always, have a good day, a good night, wherever you are. May the force be with you, always.